to. <coughs> is this a, is a kind of a non-directional mic? It'll pick up. Okay. Is it on? I forget it's kind of the center of the room. Yes, it's on. It's no, on. F1, right? I think it's the red light's on. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. Good guy. Okay. What we're going to do tonight is, is just pick up where we left off a couple weeks ago, and uh, we're going to work a few of the problems from the sample test from the morning session. That's what we mainly did last time, but we didn't get into the chemistry questions very much, so I'm going to do those. I got one math question I'll do for you. And then we'll go to the afternoon where we have the civil questions. And what I did was I just went through here and worked all the ones that came to me real quickly and figured I'd go over those with you. So it's going to be a kind of a, a mixture of hydraulics, uh, environmental, surveying, and uh, I think I have a construction management question in there that we'll, uh, we'll go over too. Okay? <laughs> so the first one that we're going to work is number nine. What well, number nine? Number nine is just a math question. And what's the value of this integral? Uh, the integra integral from 0 to pi of 10 times the sine of x dx. Okay? And you've got the, uh, what the answers are. <clears throat> okay? So the first thing we'll do is we'll pull out the 10 because it doesn't affect the integration. And we'll integrate sine of x dx. <clears throat> and the sine integrates into minus the cosine, right? So we're going to have minus cosine x x evaluated from 0 to pi. Now this was a little tricky and you'll notice that they're going to have some answers that will fit the tricks. Okay? So basically let me pull this minus sign out and I'm going to have minus 10 times the cosine of x evaluated from 0 to pi. Alright? So my minus 10 stays outside. The cosine of pi, let me write it out, cosine of pi minus the cosine is zero. All right, so that's what uh, that's what this thing expands to. What's the cosine of pi? Zero. Yeah, minus one. Oh, that's close. <laughs> pi, over two. pi over two is zero. So pi is 180. So it takes you into the minus for the cosine. It'll be minus one. Plus the uh, cosine is zero. One. Plus one. So it's minus a plus one. So it's minus one minus one, which leaves you with minus 2, and so that gives you an answer of 20. All right? And 20 is answer D in this uh, practice test. All right? But you look at your other possibilities. Okay? You got minus 10, 0, and plus 10. All right? Look where you can screw up those. <laughs> Philip <laughs> got 10. Was it Philip or you the one that hollered out? I said 0. Zero for yeah. cosine of pi. So your answer would have been uh, your answer would have been ten plus ten. Because it had a minus one here and it had a minus ten here, so his answer would have been plus ten, which is C. C. Okay. Now what happens if you get messed around with these minuses? Well, if you just you know if if you don't pick up on the minus, you could easily end up with zero as the answer. Because you've got minus 1, minus 1. So if you've got this minus in here and wiggle it around some, you could easily come up with 0. Because when I was working it in my head, 0 is the answer I got. <laughs> and I thought, I better write this down. <laughs> okay? So they'll have those, again, we talk about these plausible distractors. They'll have these answers that you can arrive at by messing something up. Okay? So I just happened to notice that when I thought, hey, I think so I thought I'd show that one to you. Now, what's the next one we got? Number number 15. Okay, so over 15. Number 15. This one's number nine. Number 15 gives you an equation: As2 O3 plus three carbons gives you three carbon monoxides plus two arsenics. Okay? Problem says, consider this equation. Atomic weights may be taken as uh, 75 for the arsenic, 16 for the oxygen, 12 for the carbon. Okay? It says, according to the equation above, the reaction of one standard gram mole of AS2O3 with carbon will result in the formation of what? Okay? 
So, we're starting with a standard gram mole of the, uh, I think that's arsenate, but I wouldn't swear to it. All right, so how do we get its weight? Well, we take 2 times 75 plus 3 times 16. All right, 3 times the uh, carbon is 3 times 12. Over here we have 3 times 12 plus 16, and then we have 2 times 75. So that's 150. This is uh, what, 28 times 3 is I don't know. Yeah, it's after my bedtime. <laughs> 84. Okay, and uh, these are the products. Okay, so it says one standard gram mole of this stuff produces some products. So it's either 84 grams of CO or it's 150, because we only have one here, right? One. 84 grams of CO or 150 grams of AS. Now, what are your what are your choices? Well, it doesn't produce a gram mole of AS. It produces two gram moles. I mean, it, the equation tells you that. Two gram moles. So that's not right. 28 grams of CO. Well, CO is 28. One gram mole of it is 28, but it produces three of them. So it's 84. So it's not that one. 150 grams of AS. That's correct. Okay? So you, the answer here is C. 150 grams of AS. Okay? Then it says a greater amount by weight of CO than of AS. That's not right. It's a lesser. It would be a lesser amount. Alright, now problem number 16 says uh, if 60 milliliters of NaOH solution neutralizes 40 milliliters of 0.5 molar H2SO4, the concentration of the NaOH solution is most near it. All right? Now, <clears throat> what you need here is to remember some things from uh, uh, water wastewater. Okay? And one of the things from water wastewater is that the volume of an acid times the normality of an acid equals the volume of the base times the normality of the base. That's a simple little equation that we use several times in water wastewater. The other thing you need to remember is that the normality of a solution is equal to the molarity of the solution multiplied by the valence. You guys remember that? You suffer through it. <laughs> okay, so this is normality. This is molarity. This is the valence. Okay? So if I have H2SO4, what, what does it give me on this? says I've got 0.5 molar H2SO4. 0.5 molar H2SO4, if I take this molar by its beta, what's the valence of it? Two, isn't it? This breaks up in the idea of uh, one gram molecular weight is the amount of a compound that produces, you know, one gram of I mean, excuse me, one gram equivalent weight, that's where you get the normality. One gram equivalent weight is the amount of a compound that can produce one gram mole of available hydrogen. Okay, this one can produce two gram moles. So you take its molecular weight divided by two to get its equivalent weight. So the molarity would be twice the normality. So this stuff is one normal. Okay, now we can use our VANA equals VBMB equation. Problem says 60 milliliters of your base, which we don't know what its normality is, uh, will neutralize 40 milliliters of a one normal acid. So, what's the normality of my base? 40 over 60. What would that be? Two-thirds, okay? So we got 0.67 molar, all right? Now, excuse me, normal, 0.67 normal. 
Now, how do we convert the normality of the base to molarity? Because all our answers are in molarity. So how do we convert the normality of this base to molarity? Same equation, but this time we're going to divide by the valence, right? So we're going to take the normality, which is 0.67, divide by the valence. Well, what's the valence of NaOH? One. Okay, so there's your answer. Okay, it's 0.67 normal, it's also 0.67 molar. Is that a choice? Yeah, answer's B. So what you need to remember or look up, I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't gone and checked and see if that uh, manual has this in it. But these two things, the relationship between normality and molarity, and the VANA equals VBNB equation, which comes in handy a couple times in this practice test. Okay, so, such as number 17. We're gonna use it number 17 too. Number 17 says, Atomic weights of sodium, oxygen, and hydrogen are 23, 16, and 1, respectively. To uh, neutralize 4 grams of sodium hydroxide dissolved in 1 liter of water requires 1 liter of 0.001 normal HCl solution, 0.01 normal HCl solution, 0.1 normal, or 1 normal HCl solution. Okay? Now here's where your VANA equation really works. Okay, B A N A equals V B N B. All right. Now, uh, both of the volumes are one liter, right? All right. So that's no big deal. One divided by one is one. We don't have to worry about that. Okay. Uh, so it says uh, we want four grams of sodium hydroxide dissolved in one liter of water. Okay, so the sodium hydroxide is uh, uh, four grams dissolved in a liter. So how do we convert that to normality? We're going to divide by the equivalent weight, equivalent weight of NaOH. Okay, so I'm going to have four grams divided by, so what's the equivalent weight of sodium hydroxide? The first thing we're going to get is molecular weight of sodium hydroxide. Sodium 23, oxygen 16, hydrogen 1. So what is that? 40? Yep. Yeah, 40. Okay? That is 40 grams per mole. But one mole of NaOH equals one gram equivalent of NaOH. Why? Bayless is one. Okay? So the molar, the gram molecular weight and gram equivalent weights are the same. Okay? So we're just going to put 40 right here. And this is 40 grams per equivalent. And all this is per liter. So we end up with what? 0.1 uh, equivalents per liter, which is the definition of normality. Normality is the number of gram equivalent weights you've got per liter. Molarity is the uh, number of gram molecular weights you have per liter. Okay? So when I come over here and plug this in right here, then what do I end up with as an answer? 0.1 normal. And what's it, what is that? C? Got the answer C? Yeah. Since you're using each, you're using one liter of each, the normalities have to be the same. So all we have to do is figure out what that normality is. All right, number 18. Number 18 says, uh, consider the following equation. K is equal to C squared bracket C squared times bracket D squared times divided by A to the fourth and B. Okay, so I got K is equal to C squared 
times D squared over A to the fourth and B. Okay? And it says the equation above is the formulation of the chemical equilibrium constant equation for which of the following reactions. So they give you four reactions. So let me take the first one and show you how we, how we do this. This isn't the correct answer. Okay? Even though there's two C's, this has nothing to do with these exponents up here. Okay? What these exponents are, are these coefficients. All these coefficients are one, right? So the equilibrium constant for this first equation is going to be the concentration of A4 raised to the one, and the concentration of B raised to the one divided by the concentration of C2 raised to the one times the concentration of D2 raised to the one. Okay? So you'll notice what they've done here. 2, 2, 4, 1. 2, 2, 4, 1. Okay? What they're testing here is a little bit of knowledge. I know something about that. And it's something to do with the thing in this becomes exponents. Okay? This is wrong. Let's look at the second. Second one says 4a plus b yields 2c plus 2d. Now the equilibrium constant for this one is going to be concentration of c squared times the concentration of d squared divided by the concentration of a to the fourth, concentration of b to the first. Okay? I think that matches what we were looking for. Okay? So your correct answer here is D. These become the exponents. All right, now, I haven't looked at it since the last time I worked this, two, two, and two, two. But does one of them have an answer like this flipped upside down? No. These, has these reversed? Doesn't have that? I do that. <laughs> <laughs> I put two C plus two D, equals 4a plus 4b. I just have to remember products over reactants. Products over reactants. Then I have to go, these are the products, these are the reactants. Right, products over reactants. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me, what's the next one? Civil afternoon decision. I know we got the after, we got all the mornings, morning ones done. Now we go to the, to the, the civil question. Ones that you guys ought to shine on. <sighs> okay, uh, number one says a slope distance uh, in a zenith angle, slope distance is 123, 456 meters, and a zenith angle of uh, 102 degrees, 54 minutes, zero seconds are measured using a total station. Horizontal distance is most near. Okay? Now, here's what we're doing here. The zenith angle is measured from the vertical. Okay? So our 123.456 meters is the slope distance, and this angle right here is 120, I mean 102, 102 degrees 54 minutes, all right? So if I convert that to decimal degrees, I take 54 divided by 60, and that's 0.9, so this is 102.9 degrees is that angle, all right? And what I want to do is I want to find this distance right here that I'll call X, okay? So horizontal distance is X in this equation, all right? One way to work this is take the 102.9 and subtract 90, right? 
If I subtract 90, I end up with what? 12.9? That angle right there would be 12.9, wouldn't it? 90 plus 12.9 is 109. 102.9? 12.9? No? Yeah. I can make sure of it. <laughs> Told you it's too late for me. Well, that's 90. 12.9. All right? So in order to get X, I'm going to say that X over 123.456 is equal to cosine, wouldn't it be? Cosine of 12.9. So X is simply equal to 123.456 times the cosine of 12.9. Okay? So, if I take cos of 12.9, multiply it by 123.456, like what they did that number, I get an x value of 120.34. Is that one of the answers? Yeah. D. D? Okay. There's D. Can we do the law of sine of there also? Uh, I think you can take the sine of that. Let me see. If I take 102.9 and take a sine of it, sine times 123.456, I get 120. Okay, so, so if you take uh, horizontal distance is equal to the slope distance times the sine of the zenith angle, that works too. And that may be in this, uh, this supplied reference, okay? Let's go to uh, the index and look up surveying which it doesn't have. <laughs> this, this index inhales deeply for air. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see, what else could we throw in here? Uh, geomatics. I bet you don't have geomatics. You've got geometric progression. Uh, that's one thing you need to do. You need to find the surveying equations and it may be under highway, highway equations. Uh, horizontal curve formulas. Horizontal curve formulas, 164. That ought to be enough to get us close. Okay, so there's a vertical curve formula, earthwork formula, area formulas, horizontal curve, latitudes and departures. What else we got? Latitudes and departures. Pavement design. I can't believe they don't have any surveying formulas like that, but they don't. So that's one thing you need to remember is uh, all your uh, all your surveying. The surveying stuff that they do give you is under uh, the transportation area, under vertical curves, horizontal curves, earthwork. Yeah, I think the uh, index needs some improving on that. Okay, but this works. Slope distance times the sine of the zenith angle, or you can convert the zenith angle to a uh, vert what we call a vertical angle, which is kind of weird, you know. You think vertical angle could be measured from the vertical, but it's measured from the horizontal. Still called a vertical angle. All right? That goes back to... George Washington days. <laughs> All right, so one way to do it is take, draw this picture. Just understand zenith angles are referred to the vertical. All right, that's how you calculate that. All right, uh, problem number two on this page. I'm going to move on this section of the test. Says, the arc definition of the degree of curve. So we're looking for a degree of curve. Now this you probably could go to the, where we just were under horizontal curves and find this definition. But basically it, it gives you some, some choices, okay? So first off, B can't be right because it's talking about chords and not arcs. Remember from 
from geomatics and from highway design, uh, there's an arc definition for a, for a curve and there's a chord definition for a curve. So if they're ta talking, ta talking arc definition, throw out the answer, it's got the chord in it, okay? Uh, and anyway, uh, the way it's, the way it's uh, defined, here's the picture. Basically, if we have a hundred, a hundred foot arc, it subtends an angle that has a degree of curve in it. Okay, so what answer would that be? Central angle subtended by 100 foot arc, A. Correct answer is A. Didn't have to work any problems, you just had to know what the arc definition was. Is that in the reference? Yeah. But I think it's, it is. It's in there? It's in there? Yeah. Okay, it's in the reference, supplied reference. Maybe. Okay? The trick is finding it. Because it's not under survey, it's not under geomatics. <laughs> it's under uh, horizontal curves. And you'll find questions like that. I mean, some of these questions, you have to work out a problem, and uh, some of them are just like definitions that you need to know, or at least be familiar with, or know where to look them up in that, in that main. Uh, number three gives us a horizontal curve that's got a PC and a PT, politically correct and PT cruiser, <laughs> has a radius of 500 feet, no meters. Okay, the tangents will be intersect at the PI, private investigator, and forms an angle of 36 degrees, 48 minutes. Okay, so it says, The area inside the quadrilateral PC to PI to PT and O is 83,164 square meters. Okay, now that includes all of this and this. Now what they want you to do is find out what this area is. Okay, the, the 83,164 is this area and this area together. But they want you to find just what the shaded area is. Okay? Now, here's basically how you're going to do this. You have, and this is probably shown on the horizontal curve problems. You have to know that this angle 3648 is also this angle right here. Okay? Now, the way you figure this out is what's the area of a circle with a radius of 500? Okay, how do we do that? Pi squared square number four, or in this case, pi r squared, right? Pi r squared, or pi times 500 squared. That comes out to be, I probably have it. That comes out to be 785, 398, I think, if I read my writing. Okay, so that would be the whole circle. How do we get the area of that segment? The area of the sector, I'll call it, it's about 10 is going to be 36 degrees, 48 minutes, divided by 360 degrees, right? That's the proportion that that thing is of a whole circle. All right, so we take 48 divided by 60, that gives us what, 0.8? 48 divided by 60 is 0.8 plus 36. So that's going to be 36.8 over 360. And we're going to multiply by that 785, 398. All right, so 36.8 divided by 360 is a little bit, a little bit more than a tenth. 
They multiply that by 7, 8, 5, 398. Comes out to be 80,285. All right? Now that would be the area of the ice cream cone. Okay? And we were given what this whole thing was. Right? So we just subtracted two. So we're going to have 83,164 minus 80,285. It looks like a little bit less than three. It comes out to be 2879. And that's answer A. Now, on, the, on these problems that I could figure out, how to get the wrong answer if I tried to, but I, I haven't, haven't built, figured that one out yet. <laughs> That's the way you work. All right, let's stop here. Under uh, Tyler's orders, I gotta stop there and move over, move back. Okay, number four. Cross-sectional areas to be excavated or cut at a certain sections of a road project are as follows. So they give you station 3, 4, 4, 435, 5, 565, 6, and 7. And then they give you the areas. Um, using the prismoidal, prismoidal method, the earth to be excavated in cubic yards between sections 435 and 565 is most nearly. Okay? Well, here is the prismoidal formula, and I'm sure it's given on the, where we were, page, uh, what page is that, uh, Adam? 165. 165? 65. 165. They have the prismoidal form we've given there? Yeah. Yes. Okay, it's L over 6 times A1 plus 4 times A in the middle plus A2. All right? So the length from, uh, 435 to 565 is 130. So we put 130, and let me just put a little arrow here. This is 4 plus 35 to 5 plus 65. That's 130. Divided by 6. The area at the, the area 1 is the one at the 435, and it's given as 322, right? 322. Then four times uh, the area in the middle. The area in the middle is station five. Okay? So this one is at station five plus zero, zero. And it's given as 395. And then the uh, last one would be station five plus 65. So this one's four plus 35, then five, and then five plus 65. Okay? And it's given as 418. Okay, so you plug all those numbers in, do all the calculations, and you end up getting that the volume is 1862 cubic yards, and that corresponds with C. Okay? That's the closest one. Alright? Now, we can use something called the average end area method. Okay, so this is a wrong way to work the problem. It's the average, <laughs> this way you'll remember it, the average end area method is a way of calculating uh, construction uh, excavations and embankments. Okay? And basically what it says is that uh, Um, the volume is equal to area 1 plus area 2 divided by 2 times L. Okay? Where area 1 is one end of the prismoid and area 2 is the other end of the prismoid. Okay? Now, the way you, since you're given that intermediate one, the way you could work this is break it up into two. 
you're gonna have you're gonna have volume one, you're gonna have volume two. Volume one is from four plus thirty-five to five, and volume two is five to five plus sixty-five. Okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have one half times those areas, which was three twenty-two plus three ninety-five, and then the distance is sixty-five, right? Well, when you work this out, you get a V1 of 23, 302.5. Then the second one is one half, 395 plus 418. Again, multiply by 65. The V2 comes out to be 26, 422.5. Okay? We add them up, the total volume is the two of them added up. 23, 302.5 plus 26, 422.5. All right? And then to get it in, that's in cubic feet. So to get it in cubic yards, we divide by 27 cubic yards per cubic foot. And this one comes out to be 1842. Okay. Did I not divide this other one by mm -hmm. 27? No. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. No, yeah, what's you do Okay. Um, so I think this is answer B, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So this is answer B. Now. Could you get the others? Another possibility, I didn't work it that way, but let's try it and see, okay? Let's suppose we take the, just the ends, the 322 and the 418 and see what we get. So just using station 435 and 565, we'd have a volume of one half, 322 plus 418 times 130, all divided by 27. What's that one come out? I didn't do that one, so Let's see what that one comes out to. Get along with it, Okay, 322 plus 418. Divided by 2 times 130, divided by 27. 1781. Now, is that a choice? No. Would be if I was making this too. <laughs> okay? So, uh, now, that 1460 ought to be that one. So there's our cut. And then coming down here, we got another cut. Okay? So we got a, we got a prison point that looks like that. So the average end area method is you take this area, that area, average them, multiply by the length in between, that gives you volume. Okay? But what the prismoidal formula does is it comes in here and figures this center area. Okay? And it takes one of these, four of these, and one of these, and divides it by six, okay, to get an average. And there's some, there's some logic behind it. I don't remember what that logic is. If you read a book on earthwork or a section of a book on earthwork, it'll explain what, why the prismoidal formula is more accurate than the average end area. All I learned when I was in college was the average end, end area method. I don't think they'd do that. Okay. But if you really want to do this, I don't know. <laughs> what you do is you plug it into whatever the appropriate computer program is. 
plug all that. You drop it from your survey guys into the machine and it spits it out. Okay. It's not like the average in area was that far off when you're talking about 1800. No, really it's not, is it? 1862, 1842. It's not going to break the bank. 20 buckets. Yeah. 20 buckets. A dollar bucket. Or $10 a bucket. <laughs> $15 bucket. It's not that far off. But I think that claim that the prismoyal method is a little bit more accurate than the average end method. Okay. So the next one I've got is number five. says that a 12 inch diameter concrete center sewer, so we got a D of 12 inches, the material is concrete, it has an end value of 0.013, uh, which is constant with depth, it flows half full, another way of looking at that is what? Half empty. Half empty. It sounds like to me the pipe is twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> it's constructed on a grade of half percent. Okay. The flow velocity in this sewer is most nearly. So we want to know what V is. Okay. We use Manning's equation. Manning's equation says that V is equal to 1.486 over N R to the two thirds, S to the one half. I figured out two wrong ways on this one. I'll share with you. Okay? Now, the numbers we're going to plug in, that was 0.013. That's given right here. Kind of hard to screw that one up. Okay? R is the hydraulic radius. R is equal to A over P, where A is the cross-sectional area of flow of flow. That's important. And P is the wetted perimeter. I had a teacher called a perimeter. <laughs> he was from Pakistan. <laughs> oh, the way did perimeter. <laughs> All right. So the area of flow in this case is one half power squared. Well, it's, they give us a diameter, right? So let's say it's one half pi over four d squared. That'd be the area of flow, right? If it was completely full it'd be pi over 4d squared. But since it's half full, it'd be half pi over 4d squared. That's the area of flow. Remember, we've got a, a circular pipe that's half full. And the wetted perimeter is going to be half of the circumference, so it's one half pi d. The wetted perimeter is the distance that is wetted. So it would be this distance right here which would be, you know, the distance around the circle is pi d, and so it would be half of pi d. Now look at this. Half and half cancel. So there's no difference between the R for a, a circle flowing full and a circle flowing half full. The R is the same. And it ends up being what? This d makes this a d squared, d squared to d, and this pi cancels, so it's what? d over 4. Right? That's R. Okay? So for R, we're going to put uh, one foot divided by four. Or 0.025. Okay? And then our S is the slope. Okay? The slope. And the slope here. is 0 0.005. That would be a half of a percent. We're taking percent, so it would be 0 0.005. All right, so when we plug all these things in, we get a velocity of flow of 3.2 feet per second. 
which corresponds to answer C in the practice test supplied answers. All right? Now, let me show you, let me show you two wrong ways to solve this problem. These are all the right ways. So here's wrong way number one. We're going to use uh, V is equal to 1.486 over N R to the two thirds S to the one half. Okay? We're going to plug in 0.013 for N, which is correct. Like I said, it's kind of hard to screw that one up. Okay? We're going to put in 0.25 for R, which is correct. And we're going to put in, guess what I'm going to put in here? 0.5. And when you do that, you get an answer of 32 feet per second, which is answer D. Okay. And then wrong way number two. And let me check this. This is right. This is right. Excuse me, that was wrong. Okay, wrong way number two. I'm going to use this one. V is equal to one over N R to the two thirds S to the one half. That's for metric, right? Okay, this is for metric. And I would be I'd be willing to gamble with you that if you look in that book, that's the equation they give you for manics. No, and you, huh? They give you Q. They don't give you the velocity. They don't give you velocity. They, they give you Q equals one over N A R the two thirds S one half. They give you that. They give you that. Huh? They give you that. They give you both of them. Okay. All right. Give you both of them. That's nice of them. But you could pick the wrong one. Okay. And if you put if you plug the right numbers in, if you plug in 0.013 and 0.25 and 0.005, you get 2.16 feet per second, which is answer B. Okay? So there's two different ways to work it incorrectly, but get answers that they provide. You want to cut some now or you want to wait till later? The camera's on. Camera's on. Okay. All right. We better not cut some now. <laughs> Dr. Pearson helps with makeup. We'll wait till later. Yeah. He helps with the electrical. Yes, I think. Probably got the electric when you turn up the tech cussing. <laughs> All right. Excuse me. Go to another one. Next one is six. Two tanks are connected by a 500 foot length of one inch ID PVC pipe. So I've got two tanks connected by 500 feet of one inch PVC pipe. All right, the appropriate value for the Hazen-Williams coefficient, C, is 150. So this is Hazen-Williams. C is the Hazen-Williams coefficient. Water at 60 degrees is flowing through the pipe at a velocity of 10 feet per second. Tanks are open to the atmosphere. Entrance, exit, and minor losses are negligible. The difference in the water surface elevation between the two tanks is most nearly. So this one's got water, this one's got water. We want to find the difference in the elevation of the water levels. Okay? So what's going to be, what's going to cause a difference in the water levels? Well, that is hated, but what's going to cause them to be different? If water wasn't flowing, they would reach the same elevation, right? But if water flowing from one to the other, if one's different, that means there's a loss of head. So what's going to cause the loss of head? Friction. Okay, because they've already said that entrance, exit, 
and minor losses are negligible. So all we're dealing here with is friction. Now, if we were using Darcy Weisbach, okay, it would be FLV squared over 2GD. That's Darcy Weisbach equation. But we weren't given the friction factor, the Darcy Weisbach friction factor. We were given Hayes and Williams coefficient. So we've got to go to the supply manual and look up Hayes and Williams. It's the same process, okay? It's just a different equation. Okay, so the Hayes and Williams equation says that V is equal to 1.318C times R to the point 63, S to the point 54. So it's more like Manning's than it is uh, Darcy Weisbach, okay? The slope here is what we call the friction slope. Okay, so we're going to solve this equation for the friction slope. Okay, we're assuming the pipe's flowing full. Okay, so R is going to be D over 4. So this thing is 1 divided by 12 divided by 4, so it's 1 over 48. D over 4, just like we found before. R equals D over 4 for a circle, flowing full or half full. It's 1 inch in diameter, so we're going to convert it to feet. Then we divide it by the 4, so it's 1 over 48 in terms of feet. Okay, S is what we're solving for. C is 150. This actually comes out to be, R comes out to be uh, 0.0208. Okay? And V was 10 per second. Plug all those in, you're going to do it, aren't you? What do you get for S? If you get the same thing I did. picture while we're doing this. Not one of these. Yeah, but did you get 0 0.364? Yeah. That's what you got. Okay. So the slope, the friction slope comes out to be 0 0.364. So the way we set that up is that Y, the, the drop in head, divided by the 500 foot over which the friction loss is taking place, that's a slope, right? And that's equal to 0.364. So when we solve for Y, we get 182, which is answer C, right? Okay, so I got an alternate way I got an alternate way to work this problem. I don't know if you want to do it or not. Let's see. Let's get rid of this. Okay. Uh, an alternate way that I work this problem was to use Archie Weisbach. Uh, an alternate way that I work this problem was to use Archie Weisbach. For some reason, I like Darcy Weisbach. I'm not really sure why. But here's an alternate solution. And we're going to use Darcy Weisbach. Okay? Darcy Weisbach says that the head law is FLV squared over 2GD. Okay, G, G is 32.2, D is 112, V is 10, L is 500. So if we can come up with a, 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 an estimate on F, 
we can work it this way. All right. Now, uh, to use to get AF, you got to use you got to calculate a Reynolds number. Reynolds number is VD divided by nu. Okay. So uh, V is ten, V is one twelve, and nu for water at six degrees is one point two times ten to the minus fifth uh, square feet per second. Okay. So if we plug all those, this is this is kinematic viscosity, if you don't remember that. Kinematic viscosity. Okay, so we solve for Reynolds number, we get 69,444. Okay? Now, the uh, the problem the, the uh, reference manual we'll probably have a Moody diagram. It's also called a Stanton diagram. Okay, let me look up the Stanton diagram. If they got that, Stanton, 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 Stanton. Where are we? Stack? They don't have it. So let's look up Moody diagram. Mm -hmm. Moody Stanton diagram, page 71. So if you go to page 71, Okay, you guys remember the Moody diagram, right? Okay, so we're going to assume that a PVC is smooth. I think that's reasonable. So if we go in here to 69,444 Reynolds number, you guys go in here to 69,444 for a smooth pipe and tell me what kind of friction factor you get. Y'all don't have this, do you? Some of you do. You don't have one? You got one? You got one? And now you guys got one? And you got one. Come up with a friction factor for me. 69,444. Get me a friction factor. For a smooth pipe. See if you come up with the same one I did. Smooth pipe, 69,444. 0.3, 0.034 over 35. What'd you get? Adam, what'd you get? 0.035. 0.035. What'd you get? Nick? Don't listen to him, just tell me what you got. 0.018. 0.018. 0.018. I like his. What I got was... Point, I got to find point oh one nine five is what I got. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. we went to the wrong side of the ten to the fourth. That's what I did. Oh, okay. So that's important. Look, you need to know how to read these things. Yeah. Okay. You need to know how to read these things because those guys are sneaky. They they allow to do it. Read on one side, read on the other side. Put those two answers in there. Okay. So I got point oh one nine five. We just plug that in right up here, run those numbers, and when you do, you get a head loss of, if you take this point oh one nine five and plug it in right there, I got 182, which is C again. So you could work at Darcy Wise box. But I recommend you work it with whatever they give you. Even though I prefer Darcy Wise box. So they won't mean to trip you up that way. No. 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 But on the other hand, I showed you that you can work it with two different equations to get the same answer, which is good. All right, now problem number seven. Uh, problem number seven says that waste activated sludge can be described as a Newtonian fluid with a kinematic viscosity of 20 times 10 to the minus 5 square feet per second. At the same temperature, the kinematic viscosity nu of water is 10 to the minus 5 feet per second, feet square feet per second. The relative roughness of the piping system is 0 0.001. Okay, the pressure drop for flow of water at Reynolds number 10 to the 7th in this piping system was determined to be 1 psi. If waste activated sludge flows at the same velocity through the piping system 
The pressure drop in PSI is most nearly. It's the pain. <laughs> okay? Would that be a good one to skip? Yeah, probably. <laughs> okay, what we're going to use on this one is uh, Darcy Weisbach. Okay, head loss is FL V squared over 2GD. Okay? The pressure drop is gamma times the head loss. Okay? <coughs> So we calculate the head loss with the Darcy Weisbach equation and then we convert it to a pressure drop by multiplying by the specific weight of the fluid. All right, they give us that the relative roughness is uh, what in, uh, I call it epsilon over D, some books call it K over D, was given as 0 0.001. And the Reynolds number, is given as 10 to the 7. All right? So you want to go back to that Moody diagram. Your Moody diagram looks something like this, okay? You've got relative rough, roughness over here on the uh, right-hand side. You've got friction factor on the left-hand side. You've got Reynolds number here, okay? And you've got curves that kind of do this, this, and then they come in here and start doing this number, okay? What you do is you come over here and find the relative roughness of 0 0.001. You come in here and find your Reynolds number of 10 to the 7. And you project this up and you follow this one until you get there and then you go straight across to get your friction factor. You guys try to do that. Those of you that got the book, try to do that and tell me what you get for a friction factor. You test again. Follow the you find the point 001 line, see where they're horizontal? Yeah. Find the point 001 line, then find 10 to the 7th Reynolds number, yeah. okay? Take the vertical line upward where the point, and where it intersects that line, because that line starts to curve, okay? Now right there you go straight across until you hit the F on the left hand side. What'd you get? Okay, I got point, I got, you got point oh one nine? Yeah. Is that way off? I got about point two when I worked it. What's the rest of you get? Point one nine five or zero? Zero. Zero. There's not point two. There's not. Uh, maybe I put my decimal point in the wrong place. Uh, might be. Well, no. factor is 0.02. Now, our Reynolds number our Reynolds number is VD over nu, right? And what this thing says is uh, the Reynolds number for the flow of water, the pressure drop for a flow of water is the Reynolds number 10 to 7. Uh, it's determined to be 1 PSI. Now, if waste activated sludge flows at the same velocity through the piping system, the pressure drop is most narrow. Okay? So basically, what happens is 
the Reynolds number was 10 to the seventh for what, right? And Reynolds number is velocity times diameter divided by kinematic viscosity. All right? Now, V and D stays the same, so let's just call it C. Okay? So C over nu is, is the Reynolds number, 10 to 7. Okay? So I can solve for C, can I? C is equal to 10 to the 7 times the viscosity of H2O. But it stays constant because it's the velocity times the diameter, and we've already seen, you know, diameter doesn't change. We've already said that the wastewater flows at the same velocity, so that doesn't change. We can't run the whole calculation because we don't know these two. We've got too many unknowns. All right? But we do know that this stays constant. So that's going to equal, that's going to equal the, uh, well, we can use that to find the Reynolds number of the, of the sewage. Okay, of the waste activated sludge. Okay, so the Reynolds number of the sewage is C over the kinematic viscosity of the activated sludge. C is 10 to the seventh times the kinematic viscosity of water, and we're going to divide that by the kinematic viscosity of the activated sludge, right? So what was the kinematic viscosity of the water? Was that given? 10 to the minus five. 10 to the minus five. What was the kinematic viscosity of the activated sludge? 20 times 10 to the minus 5. Okay? 10 to the minus 5 to drop out. So we have 10 times 10 to the 6th over 2 times 10. So that's going to be 5 times 10 to the 5th. Or that's 500,000, isn't it? So my new Reynolds number is 500,000. This is for the activated sludge. All right? Because we don't know what the velocity is, we don't know what the diameter is, we have no way of calculating them, but we do know they stay constant. So I'm able to calculate my new Reynolds number. Okay? Now, I go back in to, I'm gonna let y'all do this again. I go back into here. This time, I have a Reynolds number of five times 10 to the fifth. And I have this same 0 0.001 relative roughness. So I'm gonna go pick up the same curve, but now, and I think really my 10 to the seventh was kind of over here, wasn't it? 10 to the seventh, it may curve up a little bit. There's gonna be my five times 10 to the fifth. And so my, friction factor, I think, ends up being pretty close to the same thing. Yeah. Is it? Okay, so my friction factor stay the same. So the friction factor for the uh, water is about 0.02. Friction factor for the activated sludge is about 0.02. Okay, V stayed the same, the length stayed the same, G stayed the same, D stayed the same, Okay, F stays the same, okay, so the head loss stays the same. Yeah. So the answer is going to be one. <laughs> <laughs> Took us a long way to get to that. That might be one you want to throw away, okay, because you had to, I had to sit there for a little while to reason that one out. I got a question, you know, you know? scratched my head and kept going and I did not look in the back of the book for the solutions, I promise you. But it did take me a little while. Okay, so the correct answer there is A. So the pressure drop equals one PSI. The correct answer is A. But there wouldn't be any way you could guess that, okay? Here's one way of thinking of it. What's the difference between the two viscosities? Uh, factor 20. So is one of the answers 20 PSI? No, not there. Two. Two PSI. And I don't see how they get those answers. But that's how you got the right answer. OK? 
Okay, problem number eight. says, Sanker sewer delivers flow from a sump to a lift station, as shown in the figure below. Uh, sewer length is 400 feet, diameter is 30 inches. Sewer is made of concrete, manage roughness coefficient 0.013, constant with depth. Okay, for full pipe flow with water surface elevations in the upstream sewer sump and lift station wet well of 105 and 103 feet respectively, the discharge is most right nearly. Okay? So the first thing we have to do in this problem is figure out what the head loss is. Okay? The head loss is 105 minus 103.5 or 1.5 feet. Okay, we're just taking the difference of the two levels. Okay? Now, if you look at the inverts, uh, not, uh, let's see, you look at the, okay, okay, <laughs> if you determine the slope, I got confused myself here for a minute, when you figure the slope, the slope is the head loss divided by the lead. Now here you gotta be careful, okay? Because what we're dealing with here is friction slope versus natural, let's see, just slope of the pipe. Slope of the pipe, okay? The pipe drops a foot in 400 foot, but the friction slope drops one and a half. That includes, uh, velocity head, okay? So we're looking at total head loss. So that's going to be 1.5 over 400, and I'll put note, not one, where one was 101 minus 100. That's the, where, how the pipe drops, okay? So we have a drop in the elevation head, but we also have a drop in velocity head, okay? And that would figure in, that takes into account uh, entrance loss, exit loss, anything like that. Okay? So then our flow is 1.486 over N, A, R the two thirds, S to the one half. All right, our N value is 0.013. Our A is pi over four, times 30 over 12 squared, because it's a 30 inch pipe, right? Our R is D over four, which is 30 over 12 divided by four. And our S is 1.5 divided by 400. You plug all those numbers in, and you get a flow of 25.1 CFS, answer is B. All right, now let me, I'll show you a wrong way to do it, but you don't get an answer that they have. Why, I'm not sure. You sound disappointed. <laughs> well, the only reason I'm disappointed is because I like to show you how those wrong answers come. All right, uh, here's a wrong way. Use S equal one over 400. And then the answer comes out to be 20.5 CFS, but they don't give you that as an option. But that would be a logical mistake. I had to stand there and stare at it for a minute before I went the right way. Okay, how are we doing on time? We're doing fine. I figured if I went about an hour and a half, y'all get your money's worth. Uh, 
I know Marshall gets their money's worth because they're not paying me anything extra to do this. <laughs> this is considered, uh oh, shoot. Cramp. <laughs> okay, now I got another one. <laughs> I got one of my upper thigh and one of my calf. That's not good. Can you lay it, down? Uh, no, I'm okay. I just pause here for a minute. Uh, you know, I went for years and years. Even when I was young, I'd get, I'd get cramps in my calf, and then my foot would pull up like this, and you had to jump out of bed and stand on it until it broke down, you know? But these, these in your thigh, it's hard to do anything with. So uh, I think I'll be okay. Uh, in our contract, it says, other duties as assigned. <laughs> <laughs> but they actually ask for volunteers. I'm happy to help you guys. Okay, number 13. Guys in a generic sense, you understand there, Michelle? Mm -hmm. <laughs> number 13 says, we're designing an aerobic system to biodegrade benzene, which is C6H6. Uh, biodegradation follows the chemical reaction below. C6, A6, plus O2 yields CO2 plus water. All right, C is 12, H is 1, O is 16. Now it says, uh, note that you must balance this equation. It was nice of them to give you that hint. All right, so we got six carbons here. We're going to need six carbons there, right? And uh, we got six hydrogens here. So we need three waters, okay? And that ought to allow us to, uh, to balance the oxygens, all right? And when we balance the oxygens, we find out that we have an odd number. We've got six times two is 12, plus three is 15. So we've got 15 halves of, of a mole of oxygen, all right? Which comes out to be 7.5. All right, and then it says uh, the amount of oxygen in milligrams per liter that will be consumed to completely biodegrade the benzene is 200, 500, 800, 1600. All right, you know what this is actually doing is calculating the COD. Remember when we talked about BOD and COD? This is calculating the COD of that benzene. It's how much oxygen it would take to completely oxidize it. That's how we define COD. All right. So here's the way we work this, okay? We got six times 12 plus six comes out to be 78. And we got, uh, I guess 15 times 16? 15 times 16 on oxygens. And what does that come out to be? 240? I think that's 240. Uh, and then it produces your carbon dioxide in your water, which we're not going to pay attention to. All right, so it says uh, we have got 500 milligrams per liter of benzene. All we're going to do is set up a re relationship. 78 grams of benzene takes 240 grams of oxygen to completely burn it up. So we're going to say 78 is to 500. Actually, we ought to put it the other way. 500 is to 78. 500 is to 78 as uh, x is 240. So x is simply equal to 240 divided by 78 times 500, and that comes out to be 1538. That's the answer I got, I think. Yeah, 1538. So it says uh, most nearly. I hate that. <laughs> But the only thing that's close to most nearly there is D, right? The correct answer is D. Now let me show you a wrong way to do this. Here's a wrong way. A wrong way would just be to take the C686 plus O2 yield CO2 and water and not balance it. So then you got 32 here. You still have 78 here. So you're going to say 500 is to 78 as x is to 32. When you solve that for x, you get 
205, which is A. Okay. Now, I, my guess is this is probably the type of problem that evolves over the years. What they do is after they uh, give this test and then they grade it, they'll look for uh, problems that almost everybody misses. And they'll either throw those out the next time or they'll try to fix it so more people get it right. So I can see this problem first off saying benzene, C686, is completely oxidized to carbon dioxide and water. How much would oxygen would it take to oxidize 500 milligrams per liter? And not give you the equation. So then you'd have to come up, you take C686, add oxygen, produce CO2 and water, write the equation, balance it to get the answer. I can easily see that being, and maybe even call on what would be the COD of that waste. And you know, 99% of the people miss it. <laughs> so they say, well, maybe we better give them the equation. And not call it COD and just ask them how much oxygen is going to be. Okay? And then nobody, very few people balance it. Then the third time they put it in, they say, maybe we better put a note in there, they really need to balance this equation. And then 60%, 70% start getting it right. So then this turns into a problem that they use periodically. But I, I could see it developing that way. I've done that. I put problems on the test, people lay down die on it, and I think, well, I better give them a hint next time. Next time I put it in there, I give them a hint, okay? And the scores come out. <laughs> I don't know if y'all noticed that in water wastewater, there are times I gave you hints on how to work a problem. That's because the first time I gave you that problem, everybody screwed you that. You didn't do that on the lab test, did you? Uh, oh, I give hints? Not on the first one anyway, you didn't. <laughs> so I laid down and died the entire time. <laughs> You guys never did know, uh, no God, what's your name? I can't remember her name. We had a young lady uh, who uh, was a golfer, was uh, on Marshall's women's golf team. And she got one of the tech degrees, one of the first people that, that graduated. And she was real quiet, nice, you know. <laughs> was, was, was she here when I was there? Huh? Yes, you might have known her. Blonde head girl? No, not blonde. Kind of sandy, sandy here. Kristen White? No. Oh, I hate that. I can generally remember the girl's name. If you remember <laughs> Bati, I cannot believe you forgot her. Fahima Balucci? <laughs> Balucci, I'll never forget that one. Oh, what was her name? I'll remember it. I'll tell y'all later. But uh, anyway, she was real quiet. She's nice. And she took one of those waterways park tests. And I said, son of that. Maybe I'll need to study harder. And she completely lost it. She started screaming. I studied for 12 hours for that stupid thing. <laughs> and out the door she went. <laughs> no. You know, I thought I, I pushed her just just a little bit too far. <laughs> she came back and apologized, but I think I was totally shocked when she did that. I remember her name here for a long time. Don't don't publish that to, that I forgot her name. I keep forgetting I'm on tape here. <laughs> okay, uh, the next one is number 14. No, Stacy. Stacy was her name. I don't remember her last name for long. Where are we? Let's see. That's the wrong way. I can go to Wagner. Stacy Wagner was her name. Okay, I don't remember. A good student too. She 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 had pretty aggressive. All right, number fourteen has three wastewater flows combined in a sewer, each having flows of BOD concentrations as, as given. Okay, so many liters per day flow in a BOD in milligrams per liter. If infiltration having zero BOD is ten percent of the total flow, the resulting BOD is most nearly. What we got to do here is a uh, weighted weighted average. This is a weighted average problem. First thing we got to do is add up the total flow. So the total flow is 1.1 times 4 plus 0.8 plus 0.2 times 10 to the 6 liters per day. Let me put that capital like they did. All right. We have three wastewater flows coming in. Infiltration is 10%, right? Mm, that ain't right. I didn't do that right, I don't think. 
Yeah, dude. That works. Yeah, this is the way I worked it and I got that right inch. Okay? I'm going to tell you after I get done why I, told, I don't think it's quite right because of the way they phrased the problem. One is these flows and point one is the 10% of the infiltration. Okay, so when I work this out, I get a total of 5.5, 5.5 times 10 to the 6 liters per day. Okay? Now here's the way we do the BOD of the mixture. BOD of the mixture is equal to BOD1 Q1 plus BOD2 Q2 plus BOD3 Q3 plus BOD4 times Q4 all over 5.5 times 10 to the 6, which is total Q. Okay? So, my Q's are 4, 0 0 0.8, 0 0.2, and 4.5.5 would be my flow. Okay? My BODs are given as 200, 300, 500, and 0. The infiltration water doesn't have any BOD, it's just groundwater that's seeping in. Okay? So when we punch all this out, we get a uh, BOD of the mixture comes out to be 207. Okay? No address for later. And that would be answer what? B? Water. That answer B? Yeah. Let me go to the back to the solutions and make sure that that's right, according to them. Where did the point five come from? I'll explain it in just a minute. Uh, Don't distract me because I'm old. Okay. And I forget what I'm trying to do. <laughs> uh, the point five comes in, see this adds up four and and one is five. So the, the wastewater flow is five times 10 to six liters per day. Infiltration is 10% of that. So 10% of five is point five. Okay, so that's where this point five comes. Right. Now that's the answer that they say is right, but technically, I don't think the way I worked it matches their wording. Okay, because what does their wording say about infiltration? It's ten percent of what? Total. Total flow. Okay, so what we're saying is that I is equal to 0.1 of 4 plus 0.8 plus 0.2 plus I. Right? But what they should say for this to be completely correct is infiltration is 10% of the total sewage flow. Then that would be exactly the right way to work. But the way they just said it, now I don't know if this will give you a different answer It'll give you a slightly different answer. Let's see what it would do. Okay, so we're going to have uh, I is 0.5 plus 0.1 I. So 0.9 I equals 0.5. So I actually equals 0.5555, I think. Point, 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 point. Okay? So how does that change all of our numbers? All right, we actually get 0.55 down here, or 5.6 really, okay? And up here, it doesn't matter because it's zero. So we got 200 times four plus 300 times 0.8 plus 500 times 0.2 divided by 5.5. Still comes out to 207. That doesn't really make any difference. One, you get 207 pretty much right on the nose. The other one, you get 207.3. And the closest answer is 207. So it doesn't make any difference. And hopefully they wouldn't get that picky. Okay. We're winding it down, guys. Okay, I have got... 
15 and 16 is ready to go here. 15 and 16 all come from the same general description. We've got a municipal activated sludge wastewater plant uh, with primary clarification and digestion has the following influence characteristics, so and so, 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 so. Facilities normally operated following data apply, got waste flow rate, sludge flow rate, mix of so and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, here's question 15. It says if the plant BOD removal efficiency is, is 95%, so BOD removal is 0.95 or 95%. Okay, primary clarifier removes 35%. Okay, so primary clarifier removes 35% of the BOD. The amount of BOD-5 removed in pounds per day in the biological reaction is most near. <laughs> okay? So, first thing we got to do is convert all that data they give us to, remember, y'all probably know, but remember when we talked about W when we worked with trickling filters and with activated sludge and it was equal to flow times BOD? If your flow was in million gallons per day and your BOD was in milligrams per liter, then we had that conversion factor 8.34. Remember that? Now, for this to work, this has to be in million gallons per day, and this one has to be in milligrams per liter. Okay, so what's the flow? Flow is 5 mgd. So that works. And the BOD is given in terms of 200 milligrams per liter. That works. So if we take 5 times 200 times 8.34, I get a W of 8340 pounds per day. That's the total BOD coming in. Okay? 35% is removed in the primary clarifier. So 0.35 times 8340 gives me a number. 8340 times 0.35 gives me 2919 removed in the primary clarifier. Now my total removal is 95%. So the total removed is 95%. So that's going to be 8340 times 0.95. Now that comes out 8340 times 0.95 is 7923. That's the total removed by the plant. Removed by a plant. So if the plant removes 7923, the primary clarifier removed 2919, how much is removed by biological treatment? Bio treatment removal would be the difference in the two, right? 7923 minus 2919 turns out to be 5,000 at four pounds per day. All right? Now, did any of those answers match up? Yep. One answer is 5,004. <laughs> so that's B. Get that one dead on, didn't we? Okay, and are any of the other, look at, look at 7923. What answer is that? That answer is D. It's just a total. Wrong. And did they do anything with this one? Ha <laughs> ha! This answer is A. Wrong. The real question is how do you get the 6,592? 6,000. 6,000. 6, I don't know. That might just be a. We need one more answer, guys. Uh, how about 6,592? <laughs> Yeah, and I'm sure that's how they come up with some of these answers. 
Okay, we need an answer between 5,004, 7923. Is it the average? Random number generator. Or a random number generator. Let's see, 7923 plus 5,004 divided by 2, 6463. Is that anywhere close? A little bit. A little bit, okay. They may do something like that. I guess it's in one of those wags. Wild approximate guess. Isn't that what a lag is? Okay. Uh, but there's how you get three answers. Okay? For that particular problem. <coughs> problem number 16 also takes from some of this data. Problem number 16 says uh, the aeration basin volume is most near. So the volume of the aeration basin. Okay, so how are we going to get that? Well, we are given that the flow is 5 times 10 to the 6 gallons per day. Alright? The aeration basin hydraulic retention time. Okay? So detention time in an aeration basin. Let me put hydraulic. Hydraulic retention time in an aeration basin is 10 hours. Okay? So we have a little formula. We talked about it in water waste water. It's probably in this, uh, in this uh, supplied reference manual. If not, it's very easily figured. Okay? Q, V, and T are related. Okay? And you can figure it out by just looking at your units, okay? V is in gallons, Q is in gallons per day, and T is in days. We want V in gallons, so V equals, how do I put these together to end up with gallons as my final answer? Q over whatever that bottom thing is. T. Q over T? Q times. How about Q times T? So V is equal to the flow rate times the detention time. So I got 5 million gallons per day multiplied by 10 hours multiplied by one day per 24 hours. Okay? So my volume should come out to be 2.083 million gallons. So what are your answers? C. C. Pretty darn close. C. Okay. And I didn't find, I didn't, I don't know how much time I spent on it, but I didn't find any of those answers. Five million gallons times 10 hours. Five million gallons times 10 hours gives you 50 million, doesn't it? So that's probably where one of them comes in. Okay, looky here guys, if you don't do the conversion, if you don't do the conversion, just multiply 5 million by 10, yeah. you get answer D. Just these two numbers right here together gives you answer D. Okay, and, no, nah, that wasn't enough. I was going to do what Philip first said. I think it was Philip. Yeah. That said, take Q and divide it by T. That give me five hundred thousand. I wonder what you do if you what will you get if you and you get more than five million if you multiply by twenty four over ten. You, know, you put it in the wrong place and you convert it to twelve thousand. They give you about twelve thousand. So it's not there. So, not really sure. All right, so uh I like number 18, but I didn't pay attention to it. That's a stopping time. That might be almost a dynamics question. It has a deer in it. you probably like that. I love that. Yeah. All right, so. There's some bullets like that. Let's see. I skipped a bunch. I skipped all these structures ones. The next one that I did was uh, 28. I've got two left. We're a little bit short of two hours. The last two I've got here, one's real easy to do. Uh, 28 is a construction management question. 
Which type of contract is best suited for emergency conditions where the scope of service and materials cannot be accurately determined in advance? Not as Okay, correct answer is D. Okay, cost plus. All right. We know this. You know this. You probably had this in projects as well as construction management because you're taking it. You don't know how much work you're going to have to do. You don't know how many materials it's going to take. There's no way you can do it on some because you don't have any idea. The contractor doesn't have any idea. Okay? Uh, bonding is not a contract. I mean, you probably got to enter into a contract to get a bond, but that, that's not a type of contract. Unit pricing, again, you don't know what the units are. You don't know how many of them you're going to use. The only way to do this is cost plus. Now, to do cost plus, you've got to have a real good management team to make sure the contractor doesn't go hog wild. And you need a reputable contractor, one that will do the best job they can, know that they're going to make a fixed profit. They're going to be compensated for all the expense they have, plus they're going to get a percentage of that as a profit. And they're going to want more work. And that's, yeah. And if you both have a good relationship with each other, you can, you can work on cost plus. The problem with cost plus is that contractors will often get wasteful. My brother worked on a cost plus project once, and uh, he was a carpenter. He was in the carpenter shop, and they had a keg and eggs, a 50 pound keg and eggs. And somebody knocked it over the nail. And he had, he had set it back up right, and he was putting the nails back in the, in the barrel. And, and one of the supervisors said, we're doing this as cost plus job. <laughs> you have to go to the store and get a new, new keg and eggs. Because they're going to pay for that keg and eggs. I kind of rubbed my brother the wrong way. He and I grew up pitching pennies, you know, so we can pick the nails up. Sometimes we even straight. <laughs> <laughs> I've been throwing crooked nails away if they're too crooked. If they're just got a little bit of a bend, then you can whack them once and use them again. But, you know, if they're bent like that, just throw that away. <laughs> okay, and then 29 is another definition, okay? So we ought to be able to finish fairly quickly on that one, too. All right, 29 says, a steel bar is tested in tension at a stress less than the yield strength. What does it mean when you say you're testing at less than the yield strength? Step up forward on the line. Yeah, you are, you're in the elastic region of the stress strain curve, right? You haven't, it's still in here, okay? So, uh, the modulus elasticity is most nearly, well, we know stress equals modulus elasticity times strain. So E then is going to be stress over strength. So which answer does that match up with? C. Okay. So what, three or four of the questions I presented to you tonight were just answer, answer the question, you know, there's no calculations to do. There will be those types of questions on there. Thanks, sir. So any questions on what we did tonight? Do you think that this is a decent way to review? Yes. Or, will, yes. or will you tell me after you take the test? Yeah. <laughs> think it's a decent way to review? Yes. All right. Tell the students that didn't come that I've got some papers to give them. Don't tell them to change my life. They should change.